Since April 20th, when the BP licensed Transocean drilling rig Deepwater Horizon exploded in the Gulf of Mexico, killing 11 people, an estimated 205 million gallons of crude oil have spilled in the Gulf of Mexico. To better understand the environmental impact of the BP oil spill, we invited Dennis Hayes to share his insights. Dennis is a practical visionary who has devoted his career to environmental values. And here to introduce Dennis is Eric Lashiver, who is an environmentalist in his own right, having served on the boards of Mountain to Sound Greenway and Salish Sea Expeditions. Currently, Eric co-chairs the Environment Committee with Stephen Boy. Eric? It is with great pleasure that I welcome Dennis Hayes to the podium. Thank you very, very much, Eric. I, this is a peculiar beginning. Um, first, I have never before started speaking with a rebuttal to the person who introduced me, <laughs> uh, which, which is to say that Earth Day takes place over the course of about a three-week period, and different people have it in different dates in different locations. The official Earth Day is April 22nd. Had, had I realized at that time that May 5th was Eric's birthday, it, it, it would have been a much better choice because as the Daughters of the American Revolution ferreted out, April 22nd is Lenin's birthday. <laughs> I, 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 I also want to express some, some serious appreciation to Patrick for that, that wonderful invocation. Though again with a bit of trepidation, it is the first time before I've come up to say a few words that I've had somebody explicitly pray for me. <laughs> but wonderful set of remarks. Um, on April 20th of this year, a fire and an explosion tore through the deep water horizon, killing 11 workers. Two days later, that would be when we have the official Earth Day on April 22nd, the platform collapsed and sank, initiating the worst oil spill in American history. For several weeks, we had saturation news coverage. An underwater camera let us actually watch oil flow from a wellhead one mile underwater. The flow estimates grew from an initial 1,000 barrels a day to an eventual official estimate of 62,000 barrels a day. We watched a parade of futile attempts to cap the leak. We watched fishing vessels deployed to sop up oil. We watched volunteers try to remove that oil from birds and from marine mammals. What we did not get out of all this coverage was any sense of perspective. How important was all of this sound and fury in the grand scheme of things? That's what I'm going to try to address today. The official estimate is that the spill discharged 4.9 million barrels of oil into the Gulf. That sounds lower than what Sten told you. It sounded like 205 million, but that's because all of the reporting was done in gallons. Makes the numbers much bigger, 205 million gallons, but we typically deal with oil in terms of barrels, and you divide by 42, you get you to 4.9 million barrels. That's at least an order of magnitude larger than the amount that was spilled by the Exxon Valdez. And in fact, the Deepwater Horizon was probably the largest marine spill in history. The oil that Saddam Hussein intentionally poured into the Persian Gulf after his failed invasion of Kuwait was of the same order of magnitude, but most of the estimates have it maybe 20% smaller. There was also another big spill in the Mexican Gulf. Uh, that, too, was substantially smaller. Despite its size, the Deepwater Horizon produced far less on the visible shoreline than was accompanying the Exxon Valdez, the stuff that kept the Valdez in the news for many years. The key reason is that BP used nearly 2 million gallons of Corexit a dispersant that is banned in Europe because it contains human carcinogens. BP applied much of that dispersant a mile underwater at the wellhead. So the oil was thus dispersed in vast underwater plumes that did not reach the surface, or at least haven't reached it in bulk. That was very bad for the marine environment. It was terrific for public relations. As the rock group America sang a long time ago in A, a Horse With No Name, uh, the ocean is a desert, 
with its life underground, the perfect disguise above. If the oil doesn't come to the surface or the shore, television news cameras don't have anything to photograph, and neither Democrats nor Republicans wanted this bill in the news as elections approached. A White House official held a, new, a press conference focusing on the final National Incident Command Report assertion that the residual oil amounted to only 26% of the spill. The press covered this, as was probably intended, as suggesting that 75% of the problem had been cured. But a team of independent scientists yesterday announced that that's a crazy way to interpret it, and that between 70 and 80% of the spill still posed a danger. The biggest difference between what the scientists said and the White House officials said was that they made it clear that oil that had been dispersed in small droplets and that had been dissolved in the water were still in the Gulf and were still highly toxic in a marine environment. We won't have a full accounting of what the impact is for many years. Meanwhile, of course, the spill has had immediate economic impacts. British Petroleum's Maladroit, former CEO, remarked among his other silly statements that the spill could be looked on as a blessing in the Gulf because in the middle of an economic slowdown, the company was hiring so many people to clean up the mess. However idiotic and impolitic that statement was, it was interestingly an idiocy that's also reflected in our national income accounting. Although all of BP's expenses are added to the GDP, the value of the lost oil is not subtracted. In the computation of gross domestic product, the spill was a net positive, even after factoring in losses in the fishing and tourist industries. So if you measure national well-being by the gross domestic product, the oil spill made us a richer nation. Another economic irony lies in the way that Transocean insured its drilling rig. Through Lloyd's syndicates, Transocean had insured the Deepwater Horizon for $560 million, substantially more than the cost of its replacement. On May 9th, the Times of London reported that Transocean had made a $270 million profit on its insurance. All in all, Transocean didn't do too badly on Earth Day. In the much bigger scheme of things, however, none of this is what's really important. So if we're to put the spill in perspective, let's look at oil more broadly. The United States now consumes 19.5 million barrels of oil a day. So the spill amounted to five hours of our national oil consumption. The United States now produces only about five million barrels a day. So the spill was roughly one day's production. Because America led the world into the oil age and we fashioned a society built around oil, we have come to think of cheap, abundant oil as a birthright. That is, alas, a triumph of illusion over reality. U.S. oil production peaked in 1970, 40 years ago, at 3.52 billion barrels per year. Domestic production has declined an average of 2.6% each year for the last 40 years. The United States now consumes about four times as much oil as it produces. And in fact, the United States now consumes about twice as much oil as Saudi Arabia produces. Drill, baby, drill apparently remains an evocative political slogan now that we're again entering the silly season. But it's not a new idea. Drill, baby, drill has been the essence of American oil policy for more than a century. In the 1970s, environmentalists, myself among them, criticized that policy as drain America first. But our national drive for cheap oil endured through Democratic and Republican administrations alike. Even while Europe and Japan instituted oil tariffs and high gasoline taxes, we eliminated oil import quotas, encouraged free trade, and kept prices low, and consumed as much as we could produce, and then consumed much more. Today, the United States has less than 2% of the world's remaining oil reserves. Nations with greater oil reserves than the United States are Saudi Arabia, Iran, Iraq, Kuwait, Venezuela, the United Arab Emirates, Russia, Libya, Nigeria, Kazakhstan, and Canada. Most of these you will have picked up from that list are unstable. Several of them are overtly hostile to the United States. In fact, I'd say only Canada is generally friendly to our interests uh, outside the hockey rink. Um, 
This trend has been clear to all who would look at it for at least 40 years. In fact, it was laid out lucidly for the geological community far earlier in 1956 by M. King Hubbard. But we ignored objective reality in favor of easier, cheaper, more popular policies. Choices like that have consequences. Because of our policies, we still drive to Walmart in vehicles that were designed for the Serengeti. Americans last year drove those vehicles 60% more total miles than the Germans, French, British, Japanese, Canadians, Mexicans, and Swedes combined. And in fact, if everyone in the world drove as far last year as the average American, the total would have been more than 51 trillion miles. We have a lifestyle that cannot be replicated for all other humans. Every other industrialized country, including China, has or is swiftly building high-speed electrified railroads linking its major cities, and on and on and on. The implications of cheap oil pass through every aspect of society. Choices can be reversed, but it takes time and money to reverse a century of bad policy. With the national debt, now more than $13 trillion in the global economy in perilous shape, you can decide for yourselves whether we have the money. Uh, I would argue that we do, and that it's really, really important that we begin to spend it seriously on this energy transition, even mobilizing to something approaching a World War II style mobilization, but that would be a radical reversing of priorities. But one way or the other, it would be tough, given that we're gonna run another trillion and a half deficit as it is this year. The more fundamental question in any case is whether we still have time to complete the transition to an alternative energy future before the world oil production peaks and begins to decline. That depends, of course, on when the world oil production is going to peak. And uh, I, I, as an aside, world oil production per capita, per person, peaked in 1977. Since 1977, the growth of population has outpaced the growth of new oil production. But when is the, uh, the big element going to hit? When will oil production peak in absolute terms? Now, of course, nobody knows for sure. It could depend upon the state of the global economy, how badly damaged the Iraq and Saudi fields are, wars, terrorist acts, myriad factors. But if we haven't already passed it, it is close enough to reach throwing a softball underhanded. For a couple of years, many prominent geologists thought that the peak had been in 2005. The figures are 2005 production, 73.74 million barrels a day, 76, it went down to 73.46. In 2007, down to 73.01. But then in 2008, it went up to 73.78, 40,000 barrels a day more. That's sort of within the margin of error of these calculations. The 2009 data is not yet compiled. It will be lower than 2008. But we are in this period where that peak is very likely now to be soon. I lack the clear conviction of some of my friends in this field. I, I believe that there's some possibility that the peak might lie as far ahead as 2015, that production might grow to as much as 75 million barrels per day under the right circumstances. That would be a 2 million barrel per day increase. But as China gears up, as the world goes through this massive period of economic growth, particularly in developing countries, 2 million barrels per day kind of disappears. I'm convinced that the conventional oil game is, for all intents and purposes, over. Conventional oil production will soon begin a long, slow decline, even as economic growth and population growth increase demand. And in your very first week of Economics 101, you learned what that will do to price. This view, of course, is not universally shared, but I've reviewed the literature quite carefully and concluded that those who believe that we might have another two decades even of oil growth are basing their beliefs on a giant leap of faith. And that's a pretty shaky foundation for the global economy. But even if they were right, two decades is an incredibly brief period to completely change around the energy structure. If I'm right, the implications for aircraft manufacturers, for truck manufacturers, for yacht manufacturers, and other key elements of the Seattle economy deserve more attention than they're receiving, but it might be a pretty good moment to go long on Amazon. Um, a couple other thoughts. One, 
It's important to say that I'm talking about conventional oil resources. This includes offshore drilling, but it does not include uh, liquid fuels from bituminous sands, from oil shale, from coal. Uh, we have vast resources for that, probably comparable to the amount of oil that we have left, and in the case of coal, substantially bigger. But if you do turn eagerly to those sources, and maybe my greatest fear in this area is that we will, um, you have to understand that it will have catastrophic consequences for climate change. The amount of CO2 given off per unit of fuel extracted is significantly higher in each of them, and in the case of coal, more than twice as much. Second, peak oil is not like driving off a cliff. If we truly mobilize to shift directions, we can still achieve a fairly smooth transition as things slowly tighten year after year. However, it's deeply disturbing that in an administration that prides itself on not letting a crisis be wasted, the worst oil spill in history did not produce any meaningful response at all. And that is the sort of discussion that I wish that the Deepwater Horizon spill had provoked. Thanks. Dennis uh, has time for some questions. Uh, I see a hand up in the back. Kim, maybe you could go. Yeah. Thank you. You touched a bit on the environmental impact of oil sands. And I just read that Canada has a trillion barrels worth or something. But there's got to be some, whatever the number is, a big environmental impact to getting that out. Could you discuss that, please? Sure. Um, the, the, the really quick version is that um, to produce traditional petroleum deposits, you go through a specific five-step geological process. And it includes, among other things, a capstone up on top in a particular depth in a particular time in a particular kind of feedstock. We think of these things as pools of oil down there. There are no pools of oil down there. What you've got is oil that is infiltrated some kind of source rock. Typically in this country it would be sandstone. So where we think of this as sticking a straw down into it and sucking it out, it's actually closer to getting a grease spot out of your driveway to get oil out of an existing deposit. In the case of, of bituminous sands, or as they're typically called tar sands, of which Canada is the richest source in the world, it didn't complete that entire process. And it is still now in the sands form. You can actually go in and dig up the sands with a shovel, put it on a conveyor belt, retort it, and force the oil out of it. Or you can inject steam and cause the oil to rip down or steam underneath and force the oil to come up. There are a variety of technologies, but all of them include a huge amount of investment in energy to be able to get the net energy out. And as you run tighter and tighter on energy, you find yourself paying attention to the net energy of the equation, particularly in this case since it's all being done with natural gas, which many of us consider to be a superior fuel for a great many purposes than oil to begin with. It also requires a huge amount of, of water in a part of the nation where there isn't much. And this mining, I, I'm going on it too great a length, I realize that, but the, the mining is enormously destructive. It's, it's akin to what we see as the mountaintop mining here in the United States. It, it leaves behind a vast uh, moonscape. There is, in Alberta, I'm told, um, one golf course that you might be interested in, those of you who are serious golfers, where you go to the clubhouse and you're given a two-foot square of um, um, astroturf. And you put the astroturf on the rubble, shoot out the ball, it bounces all over the, the moonscape, and you go down there with your astroturf and keep putting it down, putting the ball on it. And make it, uh, but in, in serious terms, it, it, it does leave behind utter devastation. It, it's in a part of the world that, other than First Nations, is not much inhabited, but it, it, it would be hard to think of something more destructive. Mr. Hayes, because of the political, economic, and um, uh, environmental implications worldwide for what you've described in our use of oil, is there a growing or any signs yet of international consortiums to begin to understand how to make these changes you've described? 
Uh, yes, there, there, there remains a, a strong belief that the changes will be driven mostly by price, and it's, it's clearly true that as prices go up, uh, the amount of oil used is dramatically reduced. Uh, but beyond that, to try to do the technological development of things that are spectacular leaps forward in terms of efficiency, um, that, that does require support. We led the world in that up through the end of the Carter administration and then pretty much walked away from it. It's since been picked up by most countries in Europe, particularly in Scandinavia, Germany, and Spain, by Japan, and now increasingly China. And um, whether I could call it consortia or not, I, there, there's, there are certainly a number of joint projects among companies from countries and, and even between some of the Scandinavian countries. But this is much more a competitive response. And uh, the, the tragedy is that certainly at least until the last couple of years, we were not serious competitors. We are now getting slowly back into the game. We've got a superb new Secretary of Energy. Uh, with enough of a budget, we can both push that research agenda as, as well as the commercialization agenda. But it's, in my view, 25 years later than it should be and much smaller than it should be. But yeah, there's a lot of stuff happening. Uh, and in fact, just this year, China will emerge as the number one producer of solar equipment, solar electric equipment in the world, where they didn't even have a solar industry nine years ago. And, um, and they already manufacture more than one half of all the solar heating technologies in the world. And that's all for a domestic market. None of that is exported. Sir, in your uh, address, you spoke of the need for a mobilization such as we saw during the Second World War. I'm inclined to agree. The um, unfortunate thing is that I believe that we are so polarized on some of these issues as to what is and what isn't. To my question, uh, in this time of WikiLeaks and whatnot, the climate gate question that came up uh, number of months ago whether or not climate change was a valid issue. Could, could you speak a little bit to that? Um, sure, in, a, in a, a minute or two. The, um, the, the so-called climate gate was an email exchange, uh, a series of thousands of emails that were liberated from a computer in Great Britain and made publicly available. They had a, a number of private exchanges among climate scientists who said very disparaging things about some of their critics. They were reluctant to share data because when they'd shared data in the past, some of the critics had, in their view, misused the data, done the calculations wrong, misrepresented what they'd done. They, they used a term that is frequently used in model building where you're trying to adjust the parameters of something to achieve something that's a little bit clearer. You call it tricking it. They used that verb trick and it was then picked up by the mainstream media and made to think that it was being deceptive. There have now been, I think, three independent investigations by various scientific boards that have completely cleared them of any kind of scientific malfeasance. But I think there's generalized agreement that for all of us in our email communications, if you send it out on email, you'd better assume that the world is going to be reading it. And if you're going to be saying very insulting things about people, uh, you better be willing to say it to their face because it's going to get out there. It, it was, in my view, scientifically, though, a complete tempest in a teapot. In a world where we're relying more on electricity and we need baseload plants, why don't we put more emphasis on nuclear power? Well, the, the world is putting increasing emphasis on nuclear power. It, it's, it's small, given the scale of, of the transition. I'm one of those environmentalists who has not made that shift, as a few of my former uh, colleagues have to uh, a, a wholehearted embrace of it. This is, frankly, at least another address, but the quick version, I mean, there are all sorts of problems, including really profound economic problems. The levels of subsidies needed to make nuclear go are just so much greater than solar and wind, even with storage. But the big reason for me has nothing to do with that. No country wants to have nuclear power by having the United States go in and give them reactors, having the United States enrich fuel and sell it to them, have the United States take their spent reactor fuel, bring it back here, reprocess it into new fuel and send it back to them. It, if, if anybody did that to us, that would be worse than the recognition that our oil is now increasingly coming from the Middle East. You want to have some degree of independence, particularly if you can, and you can with the nuclear fuel cycle. However, if you have 
fissionable isotopes, if you've got enrichment technology, if you've got reprocessing technology, and you've got the know-how to operate all of that, you've got everything you need to build an arsenal. And that doesn't mean that it happens next year or the next five years, but to the extent that the world embraces nuclear power, it's my pretty firm belief, given the margins of error in every aspect of the nuclear fuel cycle and the, the tolerance, the inability to detect theft, and uh, no matter how intrusive the United Nations inspectors are, and they've sometimes been pretty intrusive and they still miss things, uh, I, I think that the world will rather rapidly have 40 or 50, rather rapidly meaning 25, 50, 75, 100 years, have 45, 50, 60 countries that have nuclear arsenals. And I'm at least as worried about that personally as I am about climate change. It's the old, does it end with a bang or a whimper? I, I haven't ruled out the bang yet. And if we don't need it, I would much rather not head that direction. Um, after reading Thomas Friedman and others for years screaming for a, a national energy policy, um, when the spill came along, as you said in your final comments, it was the opportunity to mobilize uh, Congress and the public opinion in a way that we didn't have before. And as you said, it didn't happen. What's your perception of the political realities as to why that didn't happen? And if not this administration, where is the leadership going to come from? Um, well, the, boy, complicate, there, these are all tough, complicated questions. Uh, the administration was committed to the bill, but not as committed as it was to health care, as it was to the war, as it was to Wall Street reform. And so as it put things up in queue, and in particular as it pushed Wall Street reform onto the front burner at a time when Lindsey Graham had actually signed on to what was then Kerry Graham Lieberman, Lindsey Graham thought that they were just playing partisan politics with that juggling, and, and he withdrew from the bill, and at that point there was no chance of getting enough votes. Not that I think they ever had much of a chance of getting enough votes before, but it was then not even ostensibly bipartisan, ostensibly meaning one Republican crossed over to embrace it in the Senate. Um, why? Well, there are a whole lot of reasons. One, you can't get a lot of the Democrats behind it because a lot of them come from coal states, and the coal industry has extraordinary power. I was reading in The Economist just this morning, uh, a guy who had won a, a Democratic primary against an incumbent who had voted against the climate bill but had not done so with sufficient enthusiasm and relish, so he was defeated in the, in the primary. And that guy will be facing a Republican in the final election who has said that the insurgent who took the Democratic nomination was himself insufficiently anti uh, the climate bill, and, and, and it had become this gigantic issue. Who hates it the worst? Who can bring the most passion to it? It's, it's, it, it is really fact-free politics. It has nothing to do with the climate debate. It's, it's something that's bizarre. Um, for what it's worth, uh, and she's not standing for election, so I think I can say this now, the, the best of the climate bills out there doesn't have much in the way of support at all. It, in my view, it, it's Maria Cantwell's bill. Uh, she's pretty much by herself. She's come up with something that we don't call a tax because a tax is a bad word, but it is an upstream cap and auction with a refundable revenue stream. But what they're doing is they're saying, frankly, tax is a whole lot better for me. Uh, but this, this sort of, and, and that was another reason why the other one didn't go, is that it was called cap and trade, and it had within it a wide variety of opportunities for various kinds of financial instruments that people were deeply suspicious of after the most recent financial meltdown. And cap and trade just isn't, clear that people don't know what it is. And there are a variety of other problems attendant to its offsets. In any event, Maria's bill will say in any given year there's a given amount of oil that can, a uh, given amount of carbon that can enter the U.S. economy from any fossil fuel. There are about 2,000 places, pipelines coming in from Canada, ports coming in from the Middle East, mine mouths for coal, that carbon enters the economy. And all of those 2,000 places are already federally regulated for one thing or another. You would come up with a cap and say, in this year, you can have that much carbon, the next year a little bit less, the next year a little bit less, and you can't bring your carbon into the economy unless you have a permit, and you buy those permits at a federal auction. Effectively, it is a nimble tax. It doesn't require you to go back to Congress every year because they've already set this declining schedule for carbon, 
but the tax is set by the marketplace and the elasticity doesn't affect how much carbon enters the economy, it affects how much money is collected. And 90% of that money goes back to the population on a per capita basis. So because rich people use a whole lot more fuel than poor people do, but everybody gets back the same amount of money on a per capita basis, it turns out to be a progressive tax. And instead of an income tax, which taxes stuff that we really want, which is productive labor, this is taxing something that we don't want, which is carbon entering the economy. And it's just, a, it, it's, it's really the perfect solution. And at the moment it has two prospective votes in the Senate, but we're, <laughs> we, we are hoping in the next session to maybe make it 51. Dennis, thank you so much uh, for helping us understand the significance of this environmental disaster and its, and its implications. As a side note, uh, on Sunday, an NPR story told of a Columbia University study led by Dr. Erwin Redliner uh, that indicates the toll the spill has taken on Gulf Coast residents is dramatic. The breaking up of historically stable families suicides, and the fact that 30% of children within a 10-mile distance from the, uh, from the coast have acquired some sort of mental or physical illness are all indicators of the deeper toll that the spill has taken. Recovery is indeed a long way off. We are adjourned. Thank you. Seattle Rotary Online is made possible in part by a grant from First Choice Health, working with the Washington Health Information Collaborative to use technology to bring better health care to patients throughout the Pacific Northwest. First Choice Health.